Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, my second webinar as part of NSS Ongoing Program. I'm Rachel Carmichael, and I'll be talking to you today about managing critical GMP incidents. I'm a biochemist, and I worked initially for an engineering firm, and then I joined an American multinational. And for much of the time I worked for them, better part of a decade, I worked in technical support, continuous improvement, and quality assurance. And throughout that time, I was intimately involved, could you say, uh, with the deviation system. So I've been actively involved in large numbers of investigations, uh, in their actual investigations, the review and approval, um, and then in continuous improvement role as overseeing the trends and trying to address um, the actual underlying issues of, of the deviations that we experience. Then I joined the MHRA as an inspector, and I was working there for the better part of 11 years. And during that time, I've reviewed a lot of systems and a lot of deviations, trying to establish whether this critical part of a company's controls uh, is actually functioning and is meaningful in terms of preventing issues from occurring and ensuring that the company understands the events that are, are happening. As you know, this is part of an ongoing series of webinars, and at the moment we're in the, the midst of a bit of a, an event management flow. So the last webinar was a structured approach to improving investigation report writing, and the next webinar tomorrow will apply the Kappa hierarchy to look at your corrective and preventative actions. But today we're considering the critical events, and I want to consider them from three perspectives. Yes, there's the during the event. There's how you actually manage that event once it has happened. But there's a period of time before something nasty happens to you where you have the opportunity to prepare and to avoid issues. At this point, you will be doing preventative actions. And ideally, the majority of your effort and resources should go into this issue avoidance phase. And make sure that you've got strong preventative actions that prevent these events from occurring in the first place. So we're going to consider that part first. There is, of course, the third part of after the event, which we will consider last. Think about how you are ensuring that your deviation system is effective and it, and it really works. Secondly, in terms of process, try and deal with your issues before a critical event occurs to you. In this pre-event period of time, there's also the opportunity to prepare people for an event. You want to make sure that your staff are the right people, that they've been fully trained, and that you've got enough people to deal with issues when they occur. In terms of an effective deviation system or incident system, you want to have some sort of way of identifying that something has happened. You'll collect the data on that situation, and you'll make it safe. So you'll uh, assign corrections. But there's a step then which is really critical, which is the notification and risk assessment step. And it's this awareness of whether you've got critical incidents, which is really differentiator between companies which are perhaps in denial and those which are honest and open about what is happening within their operation. Once you've decided how serious an event is, you're going to do your investigation, which means you collect as much data as you can, understand what really happened in terms of timelines, and then you go into root cause analysis, perhaps something like five whys or a fishbone diagram. But you need that investigation stage to have happened to give you the data that's needed to have a truly effective root cause analysis. From that, we will stem in corrective actions, at a later period of time, you should have effectiveness checks. The system itself should have ongoing monitoring and trending. And ideally, from that, you'll preempt issues from occurring and have preventative actions. So 
you want to focus on these preventative actions before the event occurs to you. This is a proactive activity, and it's very different from most of, of the actions that one sees, which tend to be in response to something happening. Ideally, you want to put your resources and your effort into that prevention of a potential nonconformity. Look at your operation and understand what can go wrong and how it could go wrong through the premises, through your processes. What are you instructing people to do? How do your products actually have a, a differentiation for formula, formulation and uh, their, their ability to switch based on starting materials? And then your staff, their training, and their initial suitability for the jobs that they've got. Once you've thought about your systems, you, you would have them perhaps risk ranked, and you would deal with your systems in improvement to aim to design them such that tasks are easy to do right and hard to do wrong. You need to engage with the staff and make sure that you are actively working with them to understand what it is that makes it easy to make things right first time. Now, as I said, the other element of this pre-event period is considering your staff. And you need to have staff that I, I've termed the right people. That's such a, a difficult term to consider. Um, but you have to have people who are willing to take the responsibility of the situation they find themselves in. They need to have the right training, be scientifically sound, and you need to have enough of them to deal with what's going on. This concept of the right people is, is a difficult one in some ways to actually explain, but we're talking about people who will make decisions, who have clear accountability. They, they are the people who will use the science and understanding from within the company and actually go forward and make effective decisions. They've got to be committed to that decision and they need to be able to persuade others of its merits. And there can be a number of elements that stop effective decision making. Failure to make a decision in itself is a, a decision because failing to decide what it is you're going to do is the worst type of action when you are uh, coming up to critical incidents. So in your preparation, you need to establish the kind of people you've got. Now, I'm talking to you on the 10th of July, and I'm afraid I'm going to bring it back to the current Football World Cup because there is no other subject in England at the moment. My father is a, a manic supporter of football, and he has brought to my attention the fact that the current manager of the English football team has used psychometric tests to understand his players. He wanted to determine their suitability for doing uh, critical attempts at the goal when, when it came to the crunch. They've rehearsed regularly, they've done a lot of repetition, but fundamentally they are people that act well under stress. They understand the situation that they're in, and they are able to make the action regardless of the stress that they're under. So as you're thinking about the right people to manage critical events, it's useful to look at other organizations that come under severe stress. And the Metropolitan Police have had a critical management process, critical incident management process, and they've described the decision makers and the characteristics, if you like, that are important in those individuals. They need to be capable of understanding the options that are available to them, how serious the, the actual event really is, what the limitations are on the information they've got, what kind of time frames they have, what resources are available to them, whether they should rely on their own knowledge and experience or whether they need to get in experts, and then the impact of that situation on the public. Um, and what actions do they need to take if things don't happen as anticipated? 
we can look at that list and it's very, very relevant for the pharmaceutical industry because if we make those decisions, we need to have accountability for them afterwards and we want to be able to know that we took the right actions based on our knowledge and understanding and we took that uh, with a confidence even when it's difficult to do so. We're going to be responsible for those decisions and we're going to take accountability for them, even when it's difficult to do that. So the time to work out who is the right person to be handling the event is beforehand. Understand your staff, understand what drives them, know whether they are going to be the people who will step up or whether they're going to delay and avoid making decisions. Because if you've got people who dither, they should not be managing critical events. I wonder if dither is going to translate. Uh, it means to fail to act at the time uh, when you need to. So let's go on to during the event, this point of event management. We want to know that they are going to be handled correctly and effectively. We've got this overall process, and the first stages are the initial assessment, getting the data that is available from the first point of identification as quickly and as efficiently as you can. Ideally, you want a structured process here that people can follow through. We want to consider who was involved with the event, what was it that happened, where was it and when. Get the names of the people involved, make sure we can trace back exactly what happened, who was where and when. Get a timeline going based on what you know at the point of awareness of the event. We've got to make sure that we fully characterize the event in terms of what product, what batch it was, what batch number, the, the codes. Make sure that we understand which room we're in, what the sequence of events were leading up to that event, how was it actually found, and what actions were taken immediately. Know where you were in terms of the processing steps, the date, the time, the duration. Make sure that you've got the right timing, not necessarily just from the clock in the room. Confirm that against other clocks in the facility, because sometimes these things are out of sync, and you need to confirm very early on that you've got the same time frames being talked about at every stage of your event. Very quickly, you need to prevent the use of your materials that are potentially adversely affected. There's those that are in the room, there's those that have gone before, and Anything that's under your control, start to establish the boundary. Can you limit it just to this batch? Can you prove that? Start to work through exactly the limit of the information that you've got at this point in time. So that's the first stage that we're going to go through, capturing as much information as we can and stopping the situation from getting worse. We're going to be making corrections. This is about containing, eliminating. You might put the products on hold. You might discard it. You may take equipment out of use. Uh, you may suspend your operations. But this isn't going to change whether this ever happens again. You're just making it safe on this one occasion. The next step is to make sure that we've got the right level of risk assessment so that potentially critical events come to the surface. We've got as much data as we can from that initial assessment. We've raised our incident. We've done that as quickly as we can, certainly no more than 24 hours after discovery, and we've identified the initial investigator. This person is going to take you through the risk assessment, and they, it's important that they're not associated with the event itself. They're going to be part of operations, not part of quality. The function of quality is to have oversight of the event, not to drive the actual investigation work through. I'm going to share again the World Health Organization uh, draft model for, for deviation handling and quality risk management. 
This is a document which was for the biotech industry. Um, I don't believe it's ever gone beyond the draft, but it is a fundamentally sound way of looking at your, your risk assessment. And it enables you to consider the event and decide, based on potential risk, where it sits in your flow. As a standard FMEA, a, a, um, its failure mode effect analysis, it takes on probability, detectability, and then in isolation, use severity. You multiply them up to get your risk prioritization number. But the scores in this model are quite different from those that you see elsewhere because the scores can uh, add, add up through the multiplication uh, to 216. And once you hit that point and above it, you're looking at a critical event. Anything which is between 40 and 216 or below 216 is major, and under 40 is minor. I've tried it in a number of different companies. I've tried it in uh, approaches that involved complaints rather than deviations. And in each event, it works, depending on uh, how you want to set your definitions. But it gives you a gradation that enables you to prioritize your activities and put your efforts where they're most valued. So let's look at probability. We've got four sets of scores, extremely low, low, moderate, and high. You've got things that are highly improbable to occur. You give them a score of two. You could define that as perhaps once in every three years. You, you may decide on a different extremely low uh, periodic uh, period, but this is a reasonable one. Something which is low, perhaps once every two years, moderate, perhaps twice in a year, high, perhaps most months. I think if you're having events most months, you need to be concerned. Detectability, again, we've got four groups here. You're looking here at whether you will find it or not. If you're really likely to find it, it gets a low score. So this is slightly the other way around, but it still works. You've got high, moderate, low, and non-existent. If you haven't got a control system to detect the defect, it gets a score of eight. So we've got our probability, we've got our detectability. And now, totally independent of those two, we need to consider the potential severity if the event had got through your company with nobody noticing it. It's no good saying, but it wouldn't happen. That element's already dealt with by the probability and the detectability. In the severity element, we're considering it in isolation, and we are looking at a scoring which goes from 2 to 4 to 6 to 54. This potential critical event, you're talking about serious GMP non-compliances, so these could be uh, evidence perhaps of data integrity failures, failure to do your testing on time, um, failure to process it as required by the, the product license. The other elements could be where you're aware that there's potential serious harm or death. Maybe there's contaminants in the product. Maybe the starting material is not what it purported to be. Or there could be more um, commercial concerns within this scoring. You might decide a critical impact on yield if you lose a batch. You might decide that your production capability, if there's something perhaps about your calibration process, which is wrong. And these uh, can be built into uh, the descriptions for severity so that you can score and get your risk prioritization number. And ideally, over time, you're looking at 80% of minor deviations, 20% of majors, and less than 1% of criticals. We shouldn't expect to see many criticals occurring, mostly because we want to be doing that preemptive strike, those preventative actions. So if you've got a really strong risk model, you then need to make sure that having got your potential critical event, you're going to make sure that they're notified to the most appropriate people. You should have good flow charts for your deviation system. This is joining a flow chart partway through. We've already done our initial assessments. We've decided whether it is a deviation or not. We're now deciding on the levels. If it meets the definition of critical, in good operations, that goes straight into notification of the management, senior management. It 
triggers the need to hold the product, to consider recall, field alert if you're in the States. You get your cross-functional team assigned, and then you start your investigation. If it meets the definition of major, then you don't you will not be talking about a recall situation. You may not have a notification to management. You will not need a cross-functional team. But you will have the owner assigned who's independent of the event that occurred doing the, the investigation. Minor, investigate, minor events, you need to look at whether they are repeats. And if you have got repetitive events occurring, you need to handle those as you would a major. Our criticals, we're dealing with them straight away, we're getting that notification through, we're recognizing that we're into external notification and we're accepting that. The sooner you accept the situation you're in, the better. In the UK, you've got time limits for notifications and it is within one or two working days of discovering the event if it's considered there's potential to be life-threatening, serious risk to health. Within the EU, there are legal requirements for notification, and the manufacturers need to report any defect that can result in the recall of stock or restriction of supply. So this isn't just your licensed medicinal products, it's the unlicensed ones and the stability ones. And if you have certified products in your supply chain, even if you haven't actually put it in the market yet, that is still under the umbrella of needing to notify your equivalent of your country's Defective Medicines Reporting Centre. So within the UK, the Defective Medicines Reporting Centre is where you would notify. And they've given a really helpful blog uh, on the Inspectorate blog. This is the MHRA's way of communicating at the Inspectorate level. And on there, there's a great blog uh, which describes the do's and don'ts of reporting of your events. And it tells you uh, some of the types of critical events that must be notified. And it gives you the examples where anything to do with non-conformance with your marketing authorization, be it your method of manufacture, your raw material supplies, or your artwork, if the product itself hasn't met your expected standards, maybe it's in compliance with the marketing authorization, but there is an error. And maybe you have something which isn't a registered detail, but it could still cause a problem, perhaps with barcodes that could cause problems in robotic dispensing systems. They've also said that if you've got issues associated with still really issue assurance, you need to act immediately. Don't wait till the end of the incubation uh, period. Don't make the assumption that everything's going to be fine. When you've got potential product mix-ups, they should be notified and cross-contamination, anything that could cause physical injury and anything where you've got a stability which is out of spec or an out of trend heading towards out of spec. It is not good enough to assume that the next time point will be okay. You need to be notifying early on so that the potential impact can be taken into account. Good companies, excellent companies, act quickly. They give good information to the regulator and cooperate fully. It is the combined responsibility of the license holder, the manufacturer, and the regulators to decide on recall. Defective Medicines Reporting Centre will decide whether it's a full recall because they have to make a risk assessment themselves based on availability of other product and the actual severity of the incident you're occurring. Companies cannot initiate full recalls on their own. You do it via the regulators. You want to be protecting people at risk. But a well-run event obviously would lead to recalls uh, where it is necessary. Coming back to the investigations, your, your critical events are now going to be managed by the team. You're collecting your data, doing formal root cause analysis, putting in your corrective actions, doing an effectiveness check, and then uh, ensuring that the actions stay you effective throughout 
the, the ongoing period of time. Now, we've collected all this information. We're going to be uh, putting in our, our corrections. And these people that we're looking at to be doing this work need that deep knowledge of the product and of the processes, and they need great problem-solving skills. And these are the three elements that need to have been trained in the pre-event period, because learning about your product, learning about your process, and learning problem skills whilst trying to handle critical event is going to be a, a very, very difficult task. During critical events, you're going to be contacted by any country or any client that thinks they might have had your product. Normal business is not going to happen while these events are, are happening. You're going to have to make sure you've got the right numbers of people able to man the phone, able to continue with a deep investigation, able to do all of the tasks that are going to be uh, falling upon your company. So you need people who are really risk aware, really great at that risk assessment, decision making, and have got a positive mindset because it's really difficult to maintain positivity at times. And having the people who are working the problem, working the issue, and not worrying about the what ifs that you can't control is what you need at a time like this. If you're going into the investigation phase, DMAIC, the Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve and Control, is a really strong logical process to go through. Collect your data, work out how best to display it, and, and disseminate it so that you can get other people involved. Do root cause analysis, get your corrective actions done, and later your, your monitoring, your effectiveness checks. But at the point when you're doing your investigation, doing your root cause analysis, good companies are very, very clear on what they really know and what they've assumed. And this can be difficult at times because everybody always does it that way, but we need to be sure that they always did it that way today. And hard facts for which you've got proof from independent sources are different from things that you don't have data on. I'd love to be able to say you can always trust paperwork, but as we continue to see data integrity issues, you should have a natural skepticism of perhaps the records and look for more than one set of data to support you. You're going to get a table of what is and what is not and what may be. And for the what, the when, the who, the how, and the why, consider what you really know based on the facts, what you know is not, is really not what happened based on the facts, what might have happened based on your assumptions. The next steps then are what actions are needed to prove those facts and what actions are needed to reduce the assumptions. This table will keep you clear as you work through your decision-making process. Throughout this time, our decision makers need to keep emotion out of it. Again, this is why you need to have worked out who these people are before they're put under immense stress. It's really easy to turn around and blame people, but we need to know and believe in our hearts that most people come to work to do a good job. They don't intentionally mess things up. You need all of the staff to be working with you to help you with the investigation. And when you start to blame, when you start to shout, when you start to interrogate people, people will close down. They're going to be uncomfortable when something awful has happened in a company. They're going to feel under some sort of threat and may well lack confidence in owning up to what's happening. But you need to encourage that collaboration with people remind them that the patient's at the heart of this event and that we've got to get the full story and get that documented as you go along. The time for uh, perhaps addressing whether people um, have acted entirely in line with the processes is later. First of all, we need to get the boundary sorted, work out how many batches are affected, work out the scale of this and make sure that you've you've stopped the situation from getting worse and that you are getting the information on 
how you're going to uh, stop this from happening again. Because there comes a point when you are post-event. You have done your recall. You've stayed in the factory probably for days on end. You've had lots of people on telephone calls. The product has come back to uh, a warehouse, which hopefully can hold it. It's got capacity for it. And at the point afterwards, you need to start to work on restoring confidence. And it's good to have plans for this ready before such an event should occur. You need to consider the impact to your public, to the patients, to the uh, people who've taken the product or maybe have been prevented from having their routine product. You need to consider whether your behaviors have increased your risk ranking with your regulator. If you have hidden information, if you've been found to withholding information, if you uh, find that um, there's evidence that you've not behaved as you should have done, your regulator will lose faith in you, your risk ranking will go up, you're going to have more inspections, you're going to have more oversight from them, and you need to be in a position to manage that. And then there's your own staff. They believe they're working for a good and honorable company. If things haven't gone how they should have done, you may well lose people after the event. So focus on your corrective actions. These are the actions that are there to prevent it from happening again and how you communicate them, how you, you show those existing issues and, and the problems that have occurred, how you've dealt with them, and communicate that fully and openly and transparently. As you've done your full root cause analysis and you've moved on to those corrective actions, we need to have a direct link between those two from the root cause to the actions you've taken. Can you actually do it? Can you afford what you are saying? And can you afford it everywhere? Because the action you take in this one department needs to be replicated throughout the company uh, and, and everywhere. So we want to drive to that standardization for the actions. The next two slides are some that I've had for a long time. And they are ones that really come to the problem that, that many companies have. There is a writer who, who created this, and I'm really sorry, but I've lost the source, but he's got excellent points. Some people use one of three standard corrective actions that they believe will fix everything. And they are these, these three actions which everybody accepts. So if everybody accepts them, why would you do anything different? It's discipline, training, and procedures. In terms of discipline, you, you might have a scale of discipline that starts with be more careful next time, goes up to uh, more and more draconian measures. And you know it's all to do with do the right thing. It might be training. That can't, as he writes, can be a special form of discipline if you make your training bad enough. Have you ever seen someone threatened with being sent back to training? Training should be a positive experience. It should enhance your company. And procedures, let's face it, if you haven't got one, write one. Not necessarily a bad idea. If you've already got one, make it longer. Add more checks. Make it more complicated. These three things get accepted time and time again in deviation systems, but they will not address the problems you've got. Discipline will just make people shut up. Repeating training that's already been done Probably not going to help the second time if it didn't get us there the first time. And just adding more complication in your quality system doesn't necessarily make things better. You want to be having corrective actions which eliminate problems. Make it hard to do things wrong. Make it easy to do things right. And as you go down the, the ladder, if you like, of effectiveness, you're looking at replacement, facilitation, detection, mitigation. And tomorrow's webinar, we'll look at this in more detail. But as I say, good companies, they generally follow something similar to Demaic. They get more than one person involved on critical events because we need to have a good scientific understanding of what's happening. That product and process knowledge is critical, and you need perhaps statisticians and people who understand where the boundaries are and whether you can prove it. Our critical events are best managed before they ever happen. 
get your preparation sorted, what you're going to do in those circumstances, get the ed training and education and knowledge in place, and work on your self-inspection process, work on your preventative actions. But so much of our resources go into event management and corrections, and people get overwhelmed by the scale of those events. So you need that really strong risk process so that your effort goes into where it matters the most. Think hard about pre and post the event. And during the event, our effective management is going to make sure we stop using anything that's adversely affected. We make sure we've got the right boundary of our events. We know if it's critical and we take action. We contact the agencies. We get our recalls in place and make sure that those critical incidents are notified properly and addressed by a team using actual science. I hope that this is of use to you. Um, and please join us again for our next uh, webinar, where, where, as I said, we'll be looking at that CAPA uh, effectiveness ladder. All the very best. Bye-bye.